now, and we're delighted uh, to uh, have the next speaker, George Koob, who's a renowned neuroscientist. Many of you have read his, uh, th his things and heard him present. Uh, the new director of NIAAA, and uh, we just asking him for his uh, thoughts, uh, whatever they may be, <laughs> on this uh, first day of spring. So, George. Um, I, I hope to give you a brief overview of where I'd like to go with some of the goals with NIAAA. It's really difficult following Tom McClellan um, in, a, in a talk. Uh, and I'm also going to neurologize a little bit, so um, you, you're going to have to dust off your memory of where the brain is and, and where it's connected, and I'll try and weave that all into the fabric of what I'd like to talk about. So what I'm going to do first is, is, is introduce a heuristic framework that I think is going to be useful for um, the directions we'd like to go in with medications development. And I want to expand that to say it's not just medications development, but, but treatment in general. And I believe that the behavioral treatments are probably going to ultimately always be our primary treatment. I think of medications as hamburger helper you know, in the process. And so uh, if you think of it in that way, I think it puts it in a better perspective. I'm going to very briefly talk about all this neurobiology because I think that's the framework that we need for medications development to break out of the mold that we're stuck in. And I, I really believe that we're kind of stuck in a mold that uh, has reaped some benefits, but I, we need to move in, a, in some new directions. So I'll talk about uh, addiction stages and the circuits that are involved very briefly. Uh, I promised George no data, so you get no data, you just get a framework. And then at the end, I'd like to talk a little bit about how NIAAA is looking at this problem from the perspective of a, a relatively small institute. And speaking of which, um, I particularly like this slide because it shows you that, that alcohol prevalence, uh, problems of alcohol prevalent, uh, excessive alcohol use, and excessive drug and tobacco use, and the cost to society are enormous uh, relative to the budgets that we get at NIH. So that's my uh, little tweak in that direction. But if you notice that cancer and HIV and AIDS are getting substantially more money than, than, uh, than alcohol or NIDA, um, yet the cost to society is disproportionately equal or larger, um, as, as Tom elegantly showed you just a few minutes ago. So this is the slide that um, people in my field the alcohol field will they'll sit through an 45 minutes of me talking about research just to see this slide. All right, so this is kind of the bottom line slide for the moment. So most of you are going to look at this and say, "Well, there's nothing really particularly new here," and there really isn't actually if you've been following NIAAA. But truthfully, in the last five years, nobody's been following NIAAA. In fact, to a large extent. It's the Forgotten Institute, and one of my charges is to change that. So one of the things I want to do is to pick up an old baton that's been left in the bowels of neurobiology, which is to understand the unique molecular and cellular actions of alcohol. Now, if Nora was here, and Nora Volkoff is a very good friend of mine, whom I see nowadays probably twice a week, um, she could tell you exactly how cocaine acts at the molecular cellular level. She would tell you that it blocks the reuptake of dopamine, and from that information, you would know exactly what circuits to look at for, for cocaine's initial actions, and then the neuroadaptations that occur after you've overindulged in cocaine. But what do you know about alcohol? Anybody here tell me where alcohol works? What neurotransmitters are working on? What receptor? We don't know the answer to that. And, and I intend to, to make a little more of an a emphasis in trying to understand that. And there are new techniques out there. There are crystallization of GPCRs, G protein link receptors, that uh, will allow us to actually look at receptors. We know from some preliminary work, one of which was just published by Adrian Harris with colleagues at the Institute of Pasteur, that that alcohol likes to hang out in water-filled pockets in the transmembrane area of a receptor. So this is something I'm personally interested in. We want to understand the neuroplasticity of neurocircuits that drive excessive drinking and alcoholism, and of course that's, that generalizes across all drugs of abuse, but there are going to be probably unique neuroadaptations associated with alcohol. I'll give you one example that's starting to raise 
itself in a very meaningful way. It was dismissed for many years, but alcohol uh, used excessively activates neuroimmune neuroinflammatory systems in the brain, not just in your gut or your liver. We want to develop evidence-based prevention and treatment for excessive drinking and alcoholism across the developmental spectrum from the fetus to the old age, to old age, and that, of course, has been an ongoing program. We want to understand the role of alcohol in organ pathology and develop effective prevention and treatment strategies for such pathology. Um, and we want to under, you know, increase understanding of the epidemiology and underpinnings of underage drinking and how problems of underage drinking and high-risk college drinking can be effectively addressed. This is a huge problem. I've been getting phone calls for, since I started, which was only six weeks ago, almost every week, probably several a week from the press about this game that college students are engaged in, or uh, I mean, it's just incredible the amount of interest in this issue. So we'll be ramping that up, I hope. We're already heavily engaged. We want to uh, develop improved approaches for the delivery of health services for alcohol disorders. I have absolutely no clue how to do that, but some of you undoubtedly here will be helping me do that. And then a, a big issue for me is promoting and recruiting young investigators to the alcohol field, promoting and recruiting women to the alcohol field. I'd like to see equal pay for women in, in academia. Um, that may, I don't know, I don't have a clue how to do that, but I do know that they're not equally paid for the same job, and so that's something I tend to look into uh, and see what we can do. And then of course, promoting and recruiting minorities to the alcohol field, and we have some really excellent role models in the alcohol field, and, and I hope that to use them, I've already told each of them as I see them that I wanna, want them to work with me on, on thinking some new strategies for, for promoting uh, minorities in, in research and treatment and prevention. So that's where I intend to go. One, uh, go. One, you know, one of the big priorities is going to be medications development. I feel that um, personally because of my background and work I can contribute myself to that and we're starting to rethink some of the ways that we're approaching medications development. So I thought I'd focus on that today. So. I'm just going to very quickly go through a few slides that many of you have heard me talk before or are well aware of. Um, all of us would define addiction in a very similar way, compulsive use of a drug, loss of control in its intake. But the part I add on that's the coup part is the dark side or the emergence of a, a negative emotional state uh, when access to the drug or stimulus is removed. And you, many of you know I'm quite passionate about this little piece or what I think is a big piece. I'm still trying to convince the world that it's a big piece. I have known, noticed a, a significant upswing in, in the use of my diagram since I took over as NIAAA director. So um, hopefully maybe I'll have some impact that I never had before, but whatever. Um, but the bottom line is, and this is important if we're thinking about treatment, is that this is a multifaceted disorder. And we know from the brain and the changes that occur in the brain now that it really is a, an incentive salience disorder. It's a reward deficit disorder. It's a stress surfeit disorder. And it's an executive function disorder. And that encapsulates uh, uh, you know, all aspects of the cycle of addiction um, that I espouse, that many others have. This is not the only uh, cycle of addiction that one sees, but if you, if you if you consider the fact that we have a moving target, as Tom said, that we have problems with excessive drug taking, particularly excessive alcohol taking, uh, once you get past three or four drinks a day, we have a huge problem with binge drinking. And that begins perhaps in the binge intoxication stage, but starts to translate to these other stages of the addiction cycle. And so for years I've argued that there are multiple sources of reinforcement associated with addiction. And the field has been largely focused on positive reinforcement, on the fact that drugs make you feel good. The truth is that drugs make you feel bad. And they don't make you feel bad right away. They make you feel bad once you've become over-engaged in them. And that's a source of, another source of reinforcement, which we call negative reinforcement. And I consider another one of my missions in life to define negative reinforcement. And and this came because I gave a talk at an ASAM meeting once, and I used these terms, and somebody came up afterward and said, you know, George, you give great talks, but I don't think you realize it, but no one in this room knows what negative reinforcement is. 
And then I went to the psychology department about six months ago at UCSD, University of California, San Diego, I gave a talk there on the neurobiology of addiction in the Crick conference room, all psychologists. And I said, well, at least here I don't have to define negative reinforcement. And a lady in the front row popped up her hand and said, Dr. Kube, would you please define negative reinforcement? <laughs> so negative reinforcement is when you rem where removal of a stimulus increases the probability of a response. It's an old concept. But both positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement mean your increased likelihood of drug taking. And in the case of negative reinforcement, you're removing an aversive state. So that's an important issue. So there's a circuitry that, that is involved in this. And I think it has particular relevance to thinking out of the box about how we're going to treat addiction, whether it's a behavioral treatment or a medication, a pharmacotherapeutic treatment. And that is the argument that different circuits in your brain engage, are engaged by different parts of the addiction cycle. And I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time going through the evidence for this, but suffice it to say that you can overlap the salience disorder, the reward deficit disorder, the stress surfeit disorder, and the executive function disorder with the cycles of addiction with the neurocircuitry. We've learned an enormous amount about the neurobiology of addiction. But what are we doing with it? We need to use it to move the field forward to what you all are particularly interested in. So um, George did ask me, George Woody did ask me to talk about allostasis a little bit. So the allostatic idea is that once you engage these circuits, they don't return to normal right away. And that there's a sequence of engagement of these circuits. So, this is from my dark side perspective, and these are neurotransmitters that make you feel bad that I've indicated here. And as you progress from initial use, there are actual changes in dopamine from using one, smoking one pipe of crack cocaine will change your dopamine system and possibly forever if you believe Anto Banchi, the uh, uh, direct, uh, scientific director of the intramural program at NIDA, and I do believe Anto Banchi because his work has been repeated by Rob Malenka and, and Christian Leuscher in, in, uh, in Switzerland. So even one pipe of crack cocaine can change your dopamine system possibly forever. And this sequence of changes in neurocircuitry moves to the terminal stage, as I call it, which we would label as the terminal, terminal type of addiction. And that parallels a change in how our reward system and stress system is uh, uh, functioning. And so my argument, which actually comes from Richard Solomon at Penn, the old opponent process idea, is that the opponent process doesn't necessarily follow the trajectory he argued it, it, it actually slips below a baseline, and that's the idea of allostasis, that there's a change in baseline. So you're defending um, a, an abnormal baseline. And you can think of it in terms of blood pressure if you prefer. That was the original hypothesis, that, uh, that you can function perfectly normal with your blood pressure in a hypertensive state, but it makes you more vulnerable to the possibility that you're going to blow a gasket, and it also uh, produces a wear on the system, which is what Bruce McEwen calls allostatic load. And my argument would be that as you engage in drugs of abuse, you're putting a load on your reward system and a load on your stress system. So when we get to medications, what do we have that interact with these three stages? Now, I could spend a, a lot of time telling you exactly how these drugs work, but many of you are well aware that naltrexone, for example, let's pick on that one, is a particularly effective opiate antagonist, and it's effective in treating alcoholism, and it's effective in treating op opiate addiction. But there's a catch. You have to take it, and <laughs> compliance is an issue, and it blocks the endogenous opioid system, which is part of the reward system and part of this circuitry. So many of the drugs we have that are used to treat addiction to date are drugs that interact with the reward system and interact with that binge intoxication stage. And they have a place in our armamentarium. But my argument is that we should be moving to what I call um, the dark side. I left out the drugs here, but there are only two drugs that uh, 
or a few drugs that you really could argue work on the dark side, and those include some of the partial agonists like varenicline or Chantix, also uh, buprenorphine, which is actually doing very well in, in the field. Um, those are two drugs, and methadone itself, that can reverse the, some of the neuroplasticity we associate with the feeling bad part of addiction. And that involves other circuitry. It involves part of the reward system that's gone south, the nucleus accumbens, that red blob in the middle there, but it also involves recruitment of your amygdala. And I just want to show you, um, well, I left that slide out, but I, I just want to mention that there are, and maybe I show it a little later, but there are a whole herd of neurotransmitters now that we know are recruited during the development of this stage of the addiction cycle. Transmitters you probably, many of you haven't heard of. Some of you probably heard of CRF, corticotropin releasing factor. But what about neuro, what about uh, orexin, uh, hypocretin? What, what about vasopressin? What about, uh, um, uh, uh, what, uh, dynorphin? which interacts with the kappa opioid system. These are all transmitters that are activated in the addiction process that make us feel bad, that fit in with that negative emotional state and the negative reinforcement. And then believe it or not, we have neurotransmitters that buffer our stress systems. So you probably never heard of NPY in that regard. It's a powerful anxiolytic transmitter in animals. There are no small molecules in humans that have been developed that are effective. Nociceptin is another neurotransmitter that's an effective buffer to our stress system. Um, and, and, and believe it or not, there's data that's largely unpublished now that endocannabinoids, yeah, your marijuana in your brain, actually buffers your stress system. So think about this. If you have two transmitters, one that makes you feel lousy and one that buffers you feeling lousy, and you have, because of all kinds of things that could have happened to you from early trauma to abuse to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, you have activated stress transmitters and low levels of your buffer. You're in, you're in a very vulnerable state for acquiring and maintaining addiction-like uh, disorders. And so I think it's important that we start addressing some of these other parts of the circuitry. And then one that's very, very active area in the drug abuse field and, and in the alcohol field is what about after acute withdrawal and even the early stages of protracted abstinence? Why did people relapse? You, you heard an hour of data from Tom showing you how people relapse very, very readily. And our job is somehow to prevent that. Are there medications? Are there behavioral treatments that are effective in reversing the circuitry changes? And what you're going to see more and more from NIH, Tom Insel is, and, and Nora Volkoff are leading the way, but you're going to see more and more studies directed clinically at seeing whether the brain changes as well as the behavior changes, and what are the individual differences that convey those changes. So we have two out there, acamprosate and bupropion. Bupropion um, is, is a drug that blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine and probably has some beneficial effects in tobacco uh, craving and, and, and relapse, prevention of relapse. And acamprosate is a glutamatergic drug. It's a very, very weak drug, but in some patients it seems to provide some benefit. We have lots of possibilities from the neurobiology. Uh, but they're all at the rat level at this time, to be truthful. So what about NIAAA? What have we done? Well, over the, and again, this is a review of what I've more or less just said, um, but we have uh, seen oral naltrexone approved by the FDA, uh, camprosate was approved by the FDA, injectable naltrexone is now approved by the FDA, um, and in Europe, nalmefine, which is a a, a, a naltrexone-like compound that has a little more of a kappa antagonist activity has been improved by the EMA. 
Uh, at NIAAA, we, uh, in 2007, they instigated what they called the NIAAA Clinical Investigations Group, or NSIG, and I'll talk about that in a second here. But one of the things that we're considering doing, and we're about to release the program announcement on, is that we're really interested in expanding the use of human laboratory models to bridge this gap between what I, your little neurobiology lesson I gave you in the animal models and the clinical trials. And so the idea is that we can, um, with a small institute like we are, we can standardize things like human laboratory models. In, in our in-house NSIG clinical trials, we can standardize our approach. And we can use the information that's generated to feed back to the molecular targets and the animal models to refine those and their predictive validity. Um, in the laboratory models, we now know that there are uh, a variety of techniques that are in the literature and, and that have been utilized, some of them by people here in this room. We intend to expand that and to look at all of these different um, sources of reinforcement in the process. And then the NSIG uh, paradigm that we have at NIAAA um, involves a farmer partner, or that's the goal in, in any event. They've done three clinical trials. One out of the three is, was positive with renicline, and that's been published. Um, we intend to be able to do one of these, or possibly two, depends on how funding is going to evolve a year. We have one underway with NCATS, and so that's another area where we're expanding our involvement with NIH. And so the idea here is that we can uh, uh, bridge the gap between preclinical studies and the expensive time-consuming phase three trials. We hope to have a quick turnaround in these NSIG trials. Um, we do now have access to CNS compounds from the pharmaceutical industry. That's part of NCATS's charge with NIH. And this process allows us um, some design flexibility, but also uh, the ability to deal with intellectual property, uh, which has always been a problem in getting drugs from the pharmaceutical industry. So this is my last slide. Um, I didn't talk about animal models, but I wanted to put this bullet in to remind you that in the addiction field and the alcohol field, we have some of the best animal models in mental illness. They have been validated. They're still being developed, but they're really excellent for the purposes of what I described today. Um, the transition to compulsive drug-seeking behavior involves a sequence of neuroadaptations at every level of the brain reward, stress, and executive function neurocircuitry. Uh, an allostatic view produces a heuristic framework for the treatment of addiction, both behavioral and pharmacotherapies. Uh, human laboratory studies, I emphasize here, provide an intermediate step for narrowing medication candidates for further development while providing preliminary safety results in human studies. And then clinical trials will remain a cornerstone of efficacy for medication development, but I think you're going to see a shift in how clinical trials are done. I intend to learn as much as I can from how Tom Insel is approaching this, but you're going to see a shift to important biological and genetic readouts. And I'm quite taken with, I welcome the debate, but I'm personally quite taken with quantity frequency when it comes to alcohol use disorders, and I intend to, that that be built into our, our clinical studies as well, because I think it's a metric that could be very useful. And my personal view, which I have not yet shared with Nora, is that I think you could do the same with marijuana if you wanted, but that's not my domain. So, thank you very much. Thanks, George. Uh, some time for questions? A couple? Absolutely. So, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kubin. It's uh, nice to uh, be here and, and, and welcome. Um, the development of medications, and I was just talking to someone the other day and saying, um, in this, as we, the Affordable Care Act and the movement, uh, you know, more paying attention to addiction. Uh, at the primary care level, but let's face it, this still is a country of people who want some a pill to fix it. And um, it'll be great to get more medications um, out there. And uh, 
you love Tom. I used to sit on their council, and that'll be a, a good, good, good partnership. Questions for Dr. Koo? Yes. I had a question. So, so AA is very much abstinence-driven, and I think as a result, the acceptance of medications, which have mostly looked at decreased frequency, decreased amounts, uh, has been met with skepticism and not acceptance. How, how do we drive those, that there could be outcomes that are different than abstinence? Well, yeah, that is a good question. The, the, the issue is of stigma per se with medications, the issue of, uh, I don't know whether it's AA or whoever it is, but there has been reluctance to treat a drug problem with a drug. I'll just put it that way. Um, I think the way we deal with that is, is we educate the, the professional world, like I tried to do a little bit today, of what we've learned about the biology of addiction, because that's the key. And if you understand that it's a brain disease, I'm sorry to say this, it's a no-brainer, <laughs> uh, that uh, we should be using uh, ways, uh, means, any means we can to tweak that brain back into a homeostatic state as opposed to an allostatic state. And that would be my argument. Uh, like I said, for me, medications are hamburger helper. I really think that uh, we're never going to have a pill that's going to cure your alcoholism by taking one pill and, and tiptoeing through the tulips. But we are going to have medications that might get you into behavioral treatment. Okay? It, faster. All right? Right. Uh, question right here. So, my choice. Uh, the medication that was approved in Europe, nalmethine, um, is that similar to Sebastian? Or no. Stronger? No. On both cases, nalmefine is. A, I've worked with it in, in rodents. Um, uh, nalmefine is an opiate antagonist, but it has a little more activity at the kappa opioid receptor than naltrexone. So it's just like naltrexone. It's a. It's very, very similar to naltrexone, but it has more kappa opioid antagonist activity, and that's a very complicated story. But the bottom line is that blocking the kappa opioid system seems to convey an additional. Meta, uh, 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 relapse prevention benefit, let's put it that way, because it calms the stress system a little more than naltrexone alone. But, it, but the clinicians here will tell you there are problems with nalmefine because you have to ramp it up to get to a certain level. And I believe in Europe it's, Richard, do you remember? I mean, I think it's being used only as needed, right? Yeah. So it, it, the FDA I don't think is close to approving it here. But we'll see. You know, if it's successful in Europe, that would change things. Is it also long act, longer acting? Than I think it is a little longer acting. Yeah. So we have one kind of question here, uh, Dr. Horton. Yeah. Um, your allostatic model, is that equivalent or similar to the um, hedonic tone, with a notion of hedonic tone? And is there a way to, have we had any advances in imaging that to see if we're actually improving or moving towards hedonic tone either by uh, psychosocial models of care or, or medications? No, that's a really good question. And so is it equivalent to hedonic tone? In a sense, it's equivalent to hedonic tone, but, but, it, but you could also make it equivalent to stress tone. Okay, so I just, it's, it's a double whammy, all right? Because hedonic tone, positive hedonic tone can go down stress aversive tone can go up. And so you're trying to balance the two of them. And I think what's been neglected in the field is the, is the fact that most addicted individuals have a very, very hypersensitive stress system. I mean, opiate addicts, as Maxine knows better than I, um, uh, have a residual hypersensitivity to pain that can go on for very long periods of time. So um, I think I think that's the, that's the balance. Can you measure it? Well, Nora Volkoff has been very successful at measuring D2 uh, presynaptic, uh, what she argues is presynaptic measure of dopamine activity, and you see very dramatic changes in D2 receptors in, uh, in protracted abstinence that persist for quite some time, but also eventually recover. So in that sense, that's, it's a relatively crude measure, in that sense, that is a measure of, of hedonic tone, or one piece of the hedonic tone. But other measures are underway, and yeah, those are things I absolutely think there are other pet ligands we can put some money into uh, that hopefully will provide 
those kind of insights. I mean, there's a big argument going on as to whether we're gonna, everybody's gonna get a PET scan and that's gonna determine what medication you're gonna take. I think um, certainly Tom Insel's very skeptical about that. Not that it couldn't be done, it's just un extraordinarily expensive. But using PET scans in an experimental situation and then correlating that with some neuropsychological test that reflects what the PET scan reflects, that's a different story and that could be done relatively easily with a touch screen possibly down the line. So, so is this really then, is misery of addiction a metaphor for what you're describing? For me, yeah. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm big on the misery factor. <laughs> do, the pharmaceutical industry, the development of new molecular entities, do you see much of that coming in? in, in well, that's why I was intrigued when Tom said that, that Wells Fargo is getting into the addiction field. Um, I would say to Tom, send them t to uh, some of these biotechs. Um, no, I mean, the answer is that the pharmaceutical industry is going in the other direction. This is a constant, as you know, a constant topic of the ACNP, the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology meeting. And, and, you know, they're just like any other business. So if a consultant group suggests that you should get out of CNS pharmacology for psychiatry because it doesn't, you can't make any money there, it's much too expensive to do the clinical trials, then if one company does it, then the other companies do it. And my hope is that that will start to reverse. But you are not going to see any new medications in psychiatry in the next five years because there's just none in the pipeline and nobody's doing them. So, you know, I'm assuming the pendulum will sw swing back. It would be great if, if the if the alcohol and drug addiction field could lead the way, because we have quite a large clientele. I mean, you know, what are there? Uh, 14 to 18 million alcoholics in this country. How many of them are treated, Tom? Less than 10%. So, again, uh, for me, it's a no-brainer, but I, I, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has been very reluctant to work on addiction. So, so Dr. Luke, thank you so much.